the front. Let's bring in our next guest on this news hour, Rami Khoury. He's a senior fellow at the Isam Faris Institute for Public Policy at the American University of Beirut. Thank you so much for being with us. These three clashes that we've seen in the last few days in Idlib, Rami, uh, appear to have shattered the rebel alliance. Before we get into what the future looks like for the rebels in Syria, tell us first what triggered this infighting amongst the rebel. Why this escalation now? Well, several reasons. After the fall of Aleppo to the Syrian government, uh, a lot of the rebels who were there moved to in the Idlib area or west of Aleppo in the countryside. So there was a concentration of different rebel groups who have different ideologies and different aims in many cases. Many of them are locally anchored. Many of them are uh, led by foreign jihadis. So there's a very complex situation, but they all got compressed into a small area. The second thing is with the talks that took place in Astana and with the Turks and the Russians and Iranians actively involved in trying to find a diplomatic solution, um, there is now a sense among many in Syria that perhaps there will be a shift towards uh, diplomatic talks rather than fighting on the ground. And Ahrar al-Sham and uh, Jabhat Fath al-Sham, uh, the two main groups that are, have been fighting, uh, have always been in competition for dominance in that region of Idlib and around Aleppo and in uh -huh. other parts of Syria. But those are the main areas. And now this competition has become much more intense. So it's a three or four things coming together. Right. It's a moment of reckoning, really, for the... Islamist opposition uh, in that area. A moment of reckoning. Uh, uh, now what we have is these rebels uh, forming different alliances. You have Jabhat Fatah al-Sham, formerly the al-Nasra Front, uh, and its factions. You have the Free Syrian Army as well, Ahrar al-Sham. Uh, you talked about the ideolo ideological differences uh, briefly, but what about strategically? Where do they differ? And which of these groups today is the strongest, is in the strongest position on the ground vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Syrian government forces? Well, uh, Jabhat Fath al-Sham, the former Nusra, and Ahrar al-Sham are the two biggest, most powerful groups. And right. they have thousands of fighters uh, in the area and uh, local uh, credibility uh, in many cases. Now, historically, they've cooperated with each other in many areas, and or they stayed away from each other. They didn't fight uh, against each other much in the past. In fact, at one point, they were uh, forming a coalition in something called uh, the Jaysh al-Fatah. They had one big group. Uh, so this competition has been going on among uh, groups, uh, rebel groups, for several years. And all these different combinations of groups coming together uh, is something that's not new. And the six that joined, the, the Free Syrian Army groups that joined Ahrar al-Sham uh, yesterday, it was announced this morning, uh, did so because they were being attacked by Jabhat uh, uh, Fath al-Sham, the former Nusra. And only by being close to Ahrar al-Sham could they have the power to defend themselves. Uh, so really, these two big groups, Ahrar al-Sham and Jabhat Fath al-Sham, uh, are the main ones that are, are fighting for control. Now, they would like to uh, maintain control of their area in Idlib and around it. Uh, it's unlikely that they're going to be there forever. I mean, right. at some point, the Syrian government Foreign governments who are attacking both of these groups are going to join forces. They're now busy attacking uh, ISIL, mm. but they're probably going to turn against them soon uh, as well. So this is a short-term uh, problem, but people are looking to the long-term diplomatic solution to try to jockey for position. And some of these groups might shift into a diplomatic strategy. Others will fight to the end. Right. I want to get your thoughts, Rami, before we let you go on uh, Donald Trump's proposal to establish safe zones within Syria for the refugees fleeing the fighting there. Obviously, as you've said yourself, this is a very complicated situation with several uh, rebel factions, different alliances, and so on. The Turks have said that they like this idea of safe zones in Syria. They've been saying this for some time now. The Russians were not sure where they stand on this. Are, are these safe zones likely to work? Will it work establishing these zones within Syria? Probably it could work if there was enough diplomatic pressure, uh, which is now available from Turkey, Russia, and Iran, uh, on the Syrian government to accept them and uh, to have the rebel groups also go along. So there's enough diplomatic pressure to bring this about. The key question is, do the Syrian people want this? Mm. And my guess is they probably do as a short-term measure to have a place where they cannot be bombed and they can live normally until a permanent 
agreement is reached. And, you know, and among the other things that are going on now, the Russians seem to have prepared a draft constitution that they're going to discuss with uh, for the future of Syria. And they're going to discuss this in meetings in a few days in Moscow with many of the rebel groups uh, before they go to Geneva. So there's all these different things happening at the same time. But in the, in, the, in the short term, the suffering of the Syrian people must be alleviated somehow. And the safe zones would seem to be one way uh, to do this. The only way safe zones are going to happen if the Turks accept it and the Syrian government uh, accepts it. Rami Khoury, very good to get your insight. Thank you so much for joining us here on the news. Rami Khoury, live for us in Beirut.